I'm joined by Katie Rubino, patent attorney and chair of the Life Sciences Practice Group at Caldwell IP. Great to see you, Katie. Great to see you too, Bettina. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, my pleasure. So I want to get right into it. Law firms, you know, as we've all experienced them, are generally uh, a little bit archaic, right? Lots of paper files, lots of uh, sort of old technical debt, things like fax machines that are required to be used. Um, that's sort of the experience most people have of, of a law firm even today. And it seems like the approach at Caldwell IP is quite a bit different. You guys uh, have been called sort of the law firm of the digital age. You were uh, one of the fastest growing companies in uh, the latest Inc. 5000 and seem to be using sort of data analytics, in artificial intelligence, different forms of technology. Tell me a little bit about what that really means and how you're leveraging tech in the legal sector. Absolutely, thank you so much. And we're very excited to announce that we were named the 215th uh, fastest growing private company in the US. We're the fastest growing IP law firm in the country. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, the approach we take. We take a very systematic approach to the way we file patents. So generally, I'd say most patent prosecution firms just kind of write up these patent applications, file them at the patent office, and then it's, okay, we'll wait and kind of hear back and see you know, what art unit this patent gets assigned to and what examiner this will, who will be working on the case. And we try and take a very forward-leaning approach to that where we are beta testing a software that we can put drafts of patent applications into that then tell us uh, certain certainties of which art units uh, the patent is likely to get assigned to and what our chances of success are at that art unit because there's quite a bit of variance among different art units at the patent office. So, you know, we always get, we're tickled pink when we get put into an art unit that might have a 70, 80% rate of allowance because that tells us, you know, we're gonna have a good chance of getting a patent quickly for somebody. Whereas if we're assigned to, say, an e-commerce art unit that might have a 10% rate of allowance, it's going to be a very uphill battle. And we're going to be um, really having to make some very serious arguments and get around a lot of different prior art. But we kind of use this intel to really help us make the most forward-leaning decisions for our clients. And it really lets us optimize our outcomes and this whole system that we use scrapes data off of the USPTO's website um, on a regular basis. It updates its machine learning models, and it does a lot of predictive analytics for us to really help us get very good outcomes for our clients. That's pretty exciting. I mean, I, it's sort of like you're actually able to game the system a little bit, it sounds like. It is a little bit of that, and I would say, too, that this software also, we want to just really make sure we have as much intel as we can on our situation with our clients because we know they're investing a lot of money into this IP. It's going to be a big part of their business, and we want to make sure we can get them, you know, that return on their investment and really produce um, a patent for them. You know, a lot of them need to get funding quickly. They need to have a couple of patents in hand. And any kind of tools or optics we can use to really optimize the situation and achieve the best possible outcome for our client, we want to really make sure we do. And this system, we've been using it probably, I think, around two years now. And it has really allowed us to kind of really um, take a very forward approach and it's because of our us using the system we have a 98.6 percent rate of allowance on all patent applications that we filed at the patent office so this really you know a lot of patent firms they'll get put into a really bad art unit and they'll just tell the client okay let's just abandon the application we'll go you know file something else on this and to us, we always joke around here because we never want to use the A word and abandon an application. 
we want to make sure that we're you know spending our clients money efficiently economically and that we're not just aimlessly filing ip that they're going to go you know be ten twenty thousand dollars into it and tell them okay let's just give up now um we really just try and get a win out of it in any possible way we can and in our experience even if we have to go you know maybe narrow the claims a little bit narrow the scope it's always better to have that narrow piece of ip in hand than to have nothing at all so let's get into that a little bit you know um as a venture capitalist in emerging tech i talk to a lot of different founders you know one of the things i find a really interesting question in today's sort of landscape from a technology and and you know life sciences perspective is the question of really does a startup need ip right and it does seem very dependent on um the sector right there's definitely some cases where you can argue um, you know, you really have to have IP in hand versus some of the, the companies I work with are looking at open source um, and shared source uh, predominant landscapes, right? If you're talking about decentralized computing networks and blockchain and those kinds of areas. So what's really your take? Does a startup need IP? Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic question. And I would say IP overall can be one of the most valuable assets that a startup can have. But at the very beginning, it's important to really decipher out what type of IP a startup needs, if they need any at all. So for a lot of startups, a patent, you know, they, a lot of people come to us and they think, you know, I need 10 patents. And, you know, we talk to them, we get a feel for their business and we tell them, you know, that's crazy. You don't need patents. You might need maybe some trademarks, some branding protection. And I think kind of, Figuring out the field that you're operating in, who are the competitors, what are the competitors doing, I think that can really help inform the patent process because something like a software invention might be able to rely on open source, whereas a small molecule drug, some kind of biotech invention, the patent is going to be an absolute bare minimum to entry into the marketplace. So kind of working with clients, figuring out what they want to do in finding a balance between filing that patent and maybe other forms of IP and also relying on some open source uh, things that are out there and that exist in the marketplace. So, and, you know, we often think of patents and sort of IP as a defensive tactic, but, you know, how are you seeing IP actually be used to sort of change, uh, you know, the competitiveness or the, the financial performance for different kinds of, of startups. Absolutely. So I'd say, broadly speaking, patents can really, and IP really in general, can be used to enhance the company's success in kind of three big picture ways. First, patents can establish a proprietary marketplace advantage. So what I mean by that is that sometimes getting this these patents in hand can kind of help a company build a fence around what they're doing so that other people can't just come into their space, copy what they're doing and build a whole company around that. So it kind of serves as a defensive mechanism to block out from others really coming into that area. And then number two, patents really help improve financial performance. So what on earth do I mean by that? because people think, you know, I'm gonna spend all this money on IP, how am I ever gonna recoup the costs? And I think really from the beginning, creating a patent strategy and IP strategy that aligns with a business's business objectives so that patents are filed strategically based on what are the long-term goals of the company. Are there maybe some potential competitors that would be interested in licensing the technology? If so, that's going to cause us to draft the patent in a certain way, make it kind of seem attractive to competitors, use specific language competitors will appreciate and acknowledge, versus maybe building out a patent portfolio for ultimately selling it to a larger competitor, um, or just really also using IP to add value and create new 
licensing streams, revenue streams by going into new um, silos of business, kind of expanding out on what a company is working on. And I think it's also important to remember too that, um, you know, part of the overall IP strategy needs to really be to create long-standing kind of relationships of trust with appropriate intellectual property counsel so that the all of the IP needs of the company and the questions regarding IP strategy and what a company needs to do can really be left in the hands of the patent attorneys so that the founder or CEO can focus on their business and really excel at what they're they do best so that they can go think about what are the next stages of growth for my company or who should I hire next? I mean, it blows my mind when CEOs come to us and they're telling us that they're so stressed out about this office action they have on a patent or they, they're not sure when their maintenance fees are due. And I try and just tell them, you know, leave it to me to get the gray hair and worry about those things. You can go out and do what you do best and really excel at growing your business. I mean, it does seem like a lot of this comes down to, from the sort of strategy perspective, timing, right? Because on the one hand, you know, I see a lot of founders who who fully believe they need to have a prototype in hand or something, you know, something ready before they're they're going for any kind of IP. And on the other hand, you don't really want to be too early because in part, you know, you could be disclosing elements of your business that you may not want, you know, have have light on at that point in time from a competitiveness advantage. So what, how do you think about timing for um, actually acquiring IP? Absolutely, I think that's a great question because so many times people, clients come into my office and they've built out this very complicated prototype and they've spoken to all their friends and family about it. They've disclosed it to these manufacturers and they have nothing protecting it. And I think probably the best piece of advice I can give here is to file early and file quickly. And what I mean by filing early is that right now in the U.S. we're in a first to file patent system. So if you go and disclose your invention to somebody else without having a patent filed, there's nothing that could stop them from going and stealing your idea and filing a patent on it themselves. So inventors really need to take a proactive approach and get some kind of even just a bare minimum filing on record at the USPTO. Now, in some instances, people are very concerned because they might not know exactly how their invention is going to work. They might not know how it's going to be implemented exactly in practice. And in that situation, we can always file a provisional patent application, which is a rough draft patent application just goes on record, it's not examined by any examiners. And what that can do is get you that priority date and we can draft that very broadly to encompass a lot of different ways in which the invention can be done, create a lot of optionality for down the road. And then the inventor gets a one year period to go about their business, working on the innovation, creating kind of the best mode of it, and engineering out all the quirks associated with it. Now, my second point here is to file something quickly. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Patent Office has a relatively new uh, filing program called a Track 1 or Accelerated Patent Program. And what that does is if you file a patent under that program, you get a final disposition on patentability within 12 months of filing, which is extremely fast. Most patents, if they're not filed on that track, get a final disposition in three to five years. And in the beginning, when startups need a couple of patents in hand, they want to go talk to the VCs, attract some funding, do a raise. Having a couple of those patents in hand sooner rather than later can be instrumental in the success of the business. Now, the patent office only files about 12,000 of these track one applications each year. So in our, I think our firm, we file about four to 5% of all the track ones in the country because it, to us, it's such a valuable tool. 
and it can really make a difference in the success of a company to get those patents in hand quickly and go out there and be able to do what they want to do with those patents. So, you know, we've we've seen upwards of 47 different kinds of recessions in the U.S. over the course of history, you know, triggered by different kinds of, of events, whether it's a, an economic bubble or financial crisis or um, terrorism. We're obviously, you know, right now we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, how do you see patent trends changing amidst sort of major economic shifts, right? Do you do we know anything about what happens to a company's patent strategy for economic downturn? Yes, I'd say generally speaking, economic downturns result in generating a really profound amount of entrepreneurial activity and really flurries of innovation, which most people probably we wouldn't think that. We think, you know, R&D spending is going to really be cut. But for example, during the Great Depression, we had some of the inventions that have really revolutionized modern day life came out of that period, such as the electric razor, the Xerox copy machine, and probably my favorite invention of all time, the chocolate chip cookie. But um, I think if we look at these trends throughout history, even during the 2008 financial crisis, the number of issued patents between, you know, the period of about 2005 to 2010, it remained constant. And during 2008, the height of the crisis, there was only a very slight drop in patenting activity. And I think with the current pandemic going on, we're going to see a very common trend. We're seeing a lot more people working from home, a lot more companies kind of repurposing their technology. And I think now a lot of companies are spending time, money, and resources on the R&D component so that they can really come out of this pandemic stronger than ever. And I mean, I know personally, um, since the pandemic started in March, we've just been busier than ever because everybody is wanting patents, they're innovating, and I think it's going to just really create a lot of new technological advances that are really going to have drastic impacts on society. Yep. We're seeing that too from just the founder perspective, you know, our portfolio companies, it's I think it's it's sort of trial by fire, but you you if you can make it through a major economic challenge, you come out at such a great advantage ahead of a, a lot of competition that maybe wasn't able to to be as strategic. So, it's a good good point. Um, let's go to sort of the emerging tech trends in healthcare in particular, right? We've seen obviously um, that this sector has adopted a lot of cutting edge technology in, in recent times. And, you know, also in lieu of the pandemic, I think that's that has accelerated a certain push towards everything from telemedicine to, you know, incorporating AI in, in greater capacity, even some, you know, blockchain projects and things like that. But what are you seeing as, you know, the, the actual trends that are coming acro across for the healthcare sector? Absolutely. I'd say we're seeing a ton of innovation in this area right now. And I'd say probably the biggest trend I'm seeing is this consumer-centric approach where we're seeing a ton of healthcare innovations that are focused around the consumer, because I think consumers are kind of very fed up. They're paying a lot of money for healthcare and they feel like they're still not getting services out of it. They're not sure what even services are covered. And I think we're seeing tons of medical tests, diagnostics consumers can do, order themselves, take at home. We're also seeing a lot of wearable devices, wearable tech that can help a consumer maybe diagnose their medical illness or track their progress, a lot of these kind of Fitbit style applications. And I think too, we're also seeing a real revolution in the transparency needed in the healthcare sector where we wanna see, I think we're gonna, in the next probably 10 years, we're gonna see really broad scale acceptance of things like blockchain 
in the healthcare sector. Um, I think there's a lot of applications it can be used for, not just in cryptocurrency space, but also in security of medical records, also taking out some of these third parties that might not be necessary, like insurers, and really creating more transparent trust between consumers, healthcare providers, and really just the overall healthcare experience consumers have every day. Yeah, I think, I mean, certainly from what we're seeing with, with blockchain, there's obviously a, um, you know, a really interesting push to sort of think about how some of these, you know, legacy institutions are going to adapt to an entirely different technology stack where you can actually have open internet services on top of, of a shared uh, computing resource. So the ability to do like identity and reference people's identity uh, securely and, and without without data sharing um, really does change the game in terms of um, what's possible for for healthcare. So I have also been paying attention to that. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, what about sort of more broadly in terms of just, you know, IP trends? Like what are we seeing, you know, that that's coming about for patents uh, more globally, right? Is are we seeing, you know, smart contracts and and that kind of technology already implemented, or you know, what about sort of cannabis or biochips or sort of what's what's sort of the hottest in terms of the areas we're going to see, um, and maybe which jurisdictions are are actually tackling some of the more cutting edge aspects. Sure, I think with smart contracts, we're really seeing an explosion of patent filings there. And I'd say the biggest gains we're seeing are a lot of filings coming out of Asia, specifically Japan, South Korea. And I think a lot of that has to do with their acceptance of American cryptocurrency right now. So they've adopted it, they've implemented it in their society. And now they're filing a lot of patents in their own country and also filing patents on that, those ideas and applications here in the United States as well. And I'd say we're also seeing applications of smart contracts outside just the fintech world. We're seeing it being used with IoT, digital media, renewable energy sources. Um, and I think really this growth of the patent filings in this space really indicates that there's going to be a strong economic interest in the adoption of this technology. Now, the same can kind of be said for cannabis. So early on, I'd say maybe in the past the five years ago, the cannabis patent landscape was very heavily dominated by commercial enterprises. We had a lot of these kind of pharma companies trying to get ahead of the wagon, filing patents on drugs like Epidolex, the CBD oil that controls seizures. And now we're seeing a real uptick in these startups kind of entering this space. And I think here it's really fascinating because I was reading an article a couple of weeks back that the cannabis industry itself is going to grow from a $9.2 billion industry in 2017 to $47.3 billion by 2027. So that's a huge explosion. And I think a lot of this has to do also with the trending of the kind of more acceptance on the state level of the use of cannabis. More states are allowing it to be, you know, available for recreational purposes, medicinal purposes. And also the passage of the Farm Bill in late 2018 also helped kind of legalize the use of CBD in states. So I think that in conjunction with this explosion of patent really indicates um, that a lot of companies are entering this space and it's a very upswing center of innovation. Now, all right, let's, let's move to our last segment. Then we're going to do one overrated underrated sure. and with uh, trademark. Okay, I would say those are very underrated because people, a lot of times, people don't really appreciate the value trademarks can have in an IP portfolio. People always want to go after the patents, but trademarks can really add a lot of value to the naming and branding of a company. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Katie. It's great chatting with you and hopefully we'll, we'll talk again soon. Absolutely. Have a great day.